The following podcast is for informational purposes only. The contents of this podcast do not constitute tax, legal, or investment advice. Take responsibility for your own decisions, consult with the proper professionals, and do your own research. You know, the graph, we saw that very early on at Lunar Crush. It was like all over social, people talking about it, and it grew this like really awesome community. But I think it's it's become kind of like this fundamental layer like the indexer for what is possible. TIQ podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Joe Vizzani, co-founder and CEO at Lunar Crush, a leading platform that leverages social media analytics to provide actionable insights across various markets, including cryptocurrencies. I'm willing to bet every listener today has seen or interacted with Lunar Crush. This is a deeply insightful interview with Joe. He's a seasoned entrepreneur with a captivating story to share. During our conversation, Joe talks about his roots in finance and technology, his early career experiences, and then his entrepreneurial journey that led to the creation of Lunar Crush. Throughout our discussion, Joe sheds new light on topics such as entrepreneurship and career, the crypto market, social media, Web3 communities, and digital marketing analytics, and the evolving landscape of the Web3 industry. And towards the end, I was able to ask Joe about his perspective on the graph. I started the interview by asking Joe about his upbringing in Chicago and what he was like as a kid growing up there. <laughs> yeah, I grew up in uh, Chicago, in the suburbs of Chicago, Illinois, and kid in the mid 80s, early 90s, and, you know, was heavy into sports as a kid. I was the kid playing two double headers on the weekend, along with two soccer games every weekend, traveling around. God bless my parents for going through some of that stuff. I'm now 38 and have two little ones. And I'm thinking through what that process is like already. And I'm like, oh my gosh, how in the world did they pull all this off? We just had three kids. I think about families with more than that. That's crazy. But grew up in Chicago, loved it, loved the Midwest. Yeah, as I've gotten a little bit older, I've started to ask like my parents these questions a little bit too. What was I like? And they're like, I was a very curious kid always looking for the the next kind of adventure in the neighborhood, very sociable with my friends. We came up with a lot of games, I would say, as little kids bored in the summer. Now that I've gotten older, I think a lot about being bored and the creativity that comes from that. And I think that that's an interesting lesson. But all in all, I was just an active kid, curious, did pretty good in school, but was never very interested in school. I think now that I've gotten older, I've kind of realized that school was like not set up for an entrepreneur. I just, I really don't think it was set up. It's like I could go and write a paper that gets closer to curing cancer. And I'd have a teacher be like, you know, you didn't use like six sites in this or whatever. I'm like, well, this paper is fantastic. What do you, what do you mean? I like, I, I killed this. Even at a young age, I was just, I feel like I kind of was like a little rebellious from that standpoint. But when push came to shove and I had to get the grade, I would always get the grade. I went to university, but I'm starting to kind of be in that camp of people, maybe think a little bit about other options and what's out there. Growing up, I didn't have YouTube or any of this stuff. Wow. The amount of content that's out there to learn is is pretty crazy, but just a happy kid, I would say. Curious, happy kid. When you think back on your younger self, is there a, a moment or an experience that was sort of pivotal in the way that you framed or began thinking about your career and what you wanted to do with your life professionally? Probably sometime in my early teens, you know, I was, I would say, obsessed with games and gaming, especially in my early teens. As I know, probably a lot of young men are and young women, a lot more men are probably playing games back then. It was, I played Rainbow Six and EverQuest and we would play till 5 a.m. And then I'd, you know, hear my mom or dad coming down the hallway, I had this one switch on the side of the wall that just turned everything off, you know, and it was, (laughs) I would just boom, hit that switch and like the light and I'd sprint to the couch and like pretend to sleep. 
And then they would come in the door because they would probably hear me yelling or something. And then I would be sleeping. I would see him and I'd, I'd be like, oh, I'd take a big yawn. And then I'd be like, I think I'm going to get up and I'll, I'll just, maybe I'll start playing now, you know, and that, which is like just crazy to think. But there's a lot of skills that came from, I was like an admin for, it was like the OGN network at the time. And you were just kind of keeping track of all the different clans that were out there. It was just like a little responsibility for that young age to be in charge of the keys to that and making sure that the rankings were all set and, and things like that. And part of a, a group myself. And there's just a lot of things you do in understanding how a computer works. One of the games, it was like you could cheat a little bit by like overclocking the processor. We didn't use that in the tournaments, but when we played against each other for fun, you know, just little things like that. And so I always was very interested ever since we got kind of our first home CPU for Christmas one year. I'll never forget, like my dad had this computer and it was Christmas morning and we come downstairs. He's like, there's one more thing in the basement. Now, you know, you were from the Midwest when you have basements. I have basements in California. I don't get it. And there's this huge computer. And back in the day, they're all big in this tower. And he's got Elton John playing like this one album, like live in Australia, which is still like one of my favorite albums, like playing like this hardcore song. And I just became obsessed with just computers and how they worked and more of like a power user way and like wanted to kind of figure some things out. And somewhere along the lines there, I think I was going to do something with software in some way, shape or form that was always kind of stuck in me. And then growing up also, my dad was a banker and was always thinking about the financial route. I don't know if I was necessarily really in love with the financial route more than I was interested in macroeconomics and the way that the, just the economy all kind of comes together. And I tended to do a little bit worse into my finance classes and could just ace my economics classes in college just without thinking. And I think that was just because I was very passionate about that. And so, yeah, some of them along the lines, it was this combination of technology and economics or finance that I knew it was going to maybe be that route. And I mean, gosh, Bitcoin, when I found out about that in 2015 and the rest of the kind of crypto economy that's, that's come from then, I knew that that was going to be something that I would spend potentially the rest of my life working on. Well, there's clearly a lot of overlap between what you're doing now and macroeconomic and financial themes that's embedded or baked into crypto and, and the whole industry. But if we go back to your decision at university then to pursue a degree in finance, what were you thinking at that time? I mean, you obviously had some interest in software. Your father was a banker. Were you thinking software was a little bit far off? I would just stick with the financial stuff or take us through that. It's like, you want to be the best at what you do. Even like a Gary Vee would always talk about this of double down on what you're good at. It just felt like that was something from where I was at from a standpoint that I could double down and be really good at. I feel like I almost took like a hiatus from being a power user of software after this gaming phase that I had just because it was intense. <laughs> you know, it was almost too much. And I took somewhat of a hiatus from that, I think, and grew up but never really lost that edge of like, that was what I wanted. I wasn't surrounded by it as much as I would say I was surrounded by kind of like the financial side of everything from friends to job opportunities and everything. So you just kind of find yourself meandering down that path, but, you know, always had this little knack for, and just looking at the market in general, like software is eating the world. That's where I felt like I should be building something and being obsessed with it, but not completely understanding when I was younger, how it worked. It was like, I need to challenge myself with something I don't know how to do. When I came out of school in 2008, finance was everything, markets booming. And then all of a sudden, this financial crisis, you know, I wanted to go work on Wall Street. I thought that that was going to be it. And the next thing I know, a place that I wanted to work, Lehman Brothers, like doesn't exist anymore. So I'm kind of forced to look at the market and say, what do I go do next? Right. And like, I need a job out of school. It definitely was a force function to make me rethink my career or, or not even rethink my career, just like scramble to find something. Right. And sometimes that's what you have to do. When you think back on your career in traditional finance, and I think we're talking about roughly 13 years. So over a decade of your professional experience working in finance and you had a various roles with some very large firms. But when you think back on that, are you happy about it? I mean, was that a, a learning experience for you? Something you still leverage today in, in your role and what you're doing at Lunar Crush? I wanted to go more into finance, but I ended up getting tossed into some other some other things that I did in my career. When I came out of school in 2008, I wanted to, like I said, go work on Wall Street. I ended up working for an advertising agency. 
and I was in the finance department of that advertising agency, which was like the proverbial mailroom, if you will, you know, of an advertising agency. It's like no one gets from like the accounting department into like the creative department. That would be insane. And so for me, I was kind of like, well, how do I get as close to that as I can? That's the lifeblood of this industry. And I was kind of taken for a turn because I didn't even know when I got my first job out of school, like what that company did. They're like, we're an advertising agency. I was like, is this a job? Do you pay? Like, I'll take it. <laughs> so, you know, it's like you said, finance and financial analyst. I think it was a little bit of a swindle by them calling it a financial analyst. It was accounting, general ledger. I, I got in there and one of the first weeks I was there, they were like, Hey, we won this new account. You know, it was this Miller Coors account in Chicago and like Miller Coors had this merger and they're like celebrating. And then it was like, come to the party. And it was like the Backstreet Boys were playing like in our office. <laughs> I was like, what is going on here? This is insane. And they did like a Q and a after, and I'm like probably the fifth day on the job and the advertising agency tends to be, there's more women working there. So a lot of these women were at the age group that were like obsessed with the Backstreet Boys. And so no one was raising their hand. And so I just raised my hand. I don't know if I like looked it up beforehand or something, but I think one of the guys wasn't with the band anymore. And so I said, like, what's it like making music without Kevin? And they all turned their head and everyone like turned to me like, who's this kid or whatnot. And I, I don't, I don't remember what happened after that. I probably blacked out, but that was a fun experience for me to, be introduced to kind of the creative process and what that was. And being that kind of curious mindset, I was always like, well, how do I kind of move around this organization? What else is there to do? And found out pretty quickly that some of the skill set that I had in finance could cross over into production and business management. And so I was like, okay, I can work with spreadsheets. I can make budgets. I can figure this out. And that got me a little bit closer to some of the stuff that they were doing around like radio production and television production. And those were things for me. It's like growing up in Chicago as a finance kid, I was like, this is Hollywood type stuff, which was really exciting and fun for me to, to learn about. And so then on some other paths in my career, you know, I love that, that job. It got me out to California, loved working at the office that they had out here. Great opportunity I got from my boss at the time, Eric, who was a cheerleader for me and, and knew what I was capable of. And so continue to work on that. But eventually wanted to try some other stuff as well. And so, you know, as you kind of adapt in your career, it's like, for me, I've always just like jumped into something different. The GRGIQ podcast is made possible by a generous grant from the Graph Foundation. The Graph Grants program provides support for protocol infrastructure, tooling, dApps, subgraphs, and community building efforts. Learn more at the Foundation. That's the Foundation. Hi, this is GRTIQ, and thank you for listening. Listeners who enjoy this content can help support the GRTIQ podcast by leaving a review or a five-star rating wherever they download podcasts, by sharing episodes on social media, or by simply telling a friend or colleague about something they heard or learned from one of our guests. It's support from listeners like you that make it possible for us to keep shining a light on the people and stories behind Web3 and the graph. Welcome back. For listeners of this podcast who are younger, right? So maybe at their point in their life, they're kind of where you were at that point in your life, trying to figure out career. And like you said, the 08 crisis happened. And so you were just looking for a job and you wanted to get to work. And maybe there's listeners that are trying to do the same, or maybe they're trying to massage their career and kind of find the direction they need to go. But as you look back on that time in your life, what's the insight or the advice to anybody that's trying to navigate something similar? You know, you come out of school and you think you you might be working on all of this really interesting stuff. And then you get there and you're like, man, I really wish they took like Xerox 101 in school. Cause like, I'm just making copies or whatever else I'm doing. It's like, you don't know what you don't know. And I would say, be okay with that in your twenties. It's like, depending on who you are, wherever you're at is where you're supposed to be. And it's okay. And have these aspirations to do things, stay curious, ask questions, be timely skate to where the puck is going and like predict a little bit what the person you're working with or your boss, if they're a quality boss and they're a kind person, try and figure out and always be one step ahead. And if you're not exactly where you want to be at that second, that's okay. Like you have to have some patience 
if you're listening to this and you're 22 or 23 and you're like, I'm th- this job and I should be better than that. It's like, maybe you shouldn't be because you're not there and that's okay. And just be okay with where you're at. And depending on who you are, and what you're doing, it's like, have some fun in your twenties, focus on your friends and some travel. And if you've got friends that are consultants that can travel on the weekends, like go stay in their hotel rooms and take advantage of those things and explore a little bit. Because for most people, if you eventually want to you know, have a family and, and all those things, like it does change your ability to do things. Like obviously it, it opens up a lot of opportunities, but also is a lot different. I can't go sleep on couches or don't go sleep on couches of friends and just leave on a whim with the family now. I would say just like have some fun. I got some great advice from a previous friend and boss of mine, you know, when I was interning in college and I called him around the same time when I was like 25 or whatnot. And I was like, Joe, his name was Joe too. I was like, I don't know, man. Like I just like, I want to be doing this. I don't want to do next. And he's like, just go have a little bit of fun in your twenties, explore, figure some things out, meet people, travel around, maybe move a couple of times and figure out what you want. And I think a lot of people are probably like that. I'd say, sure, there's probably a subset of people in their 20s, you know, you see some of the entrepreneurs that started and it's like, sure, I can name the names of like the Mark Zuckerbergs or whatnot of the world, but there's a thousand of unnamed people that also do really well that they don't want to go do those things. And they're like, I'm just going to crank as hard as I can in my 20s. I'm going to start my own thing and I'm going to go after it. That's a, a little bit of a different path for some people. I'd say a lot of people actually are probably in the camp of trying to get some experience first and then maybe going and trying something. A lot of entrepreneurs that do well, I think I read the other day, the average exit, the average age is over 50. People would think, oh, all these entrepreneurs that start companies are in their 20s and that's how it works. It's like, not, that's not true. So I'd say have some fun and like be patient and it's okay that you don't know everything. Just go learn, find good mentors, find people that you know, are five years ahead of you where you want to be. Stay close to those people. Find people that are 10 years, 15 years ahead and really just try to talk to them and understand where you are in your life based on that. And I think it's like finding good mentors is pretty pivotal. In 2014, you took another sort of turn in your career and we're taking big leaps here, obviously, but you throw your hand into entrepreneurship and you launch Lifeline Response. Was that your first entrepreneurial venture? It was, yeah. I was brought in by uh, another friend of mine. He called me one day and he's like, hey, I've got this idea. Here's this app that I'm building. Like, do you want to be a part of it? And I said, sure. For me, it was like just making another jump. People talk about risk. That's one huge lesson also to people that are younger is that everyone thinks that there's this like huge risk to starting a company or going and starting something on your own. The risk to me is not trying something on your own. That's why it's important when you're a little bit younger, whether it's like benefits, you know, that's a whole nother avenue. That's one of the main reasons people don't start companies is like, how can I afford to stay healthy? It's like, my gosh, how are we stifling innovation by not taking care of people? But I don't know what the answer is there. There's a rub there. But yeah, that was my first venture in. We so I happened to get into like a Techstars program in Kansas City. It was one of their first powered by programs in 2014 with Sprint. For me, it was another one of those opportunities where I, my eyes were wide open and you're drinking from a fire hose and you're like, what is this world? What's going on? But I, I do remember being there and in the first week, you know, there's 10 companies and meeting some of the people that had started these other companies and being a part of that where I, I realized like, oh, this is who I am for sure these are my people. These are the people that are, you know, I can have conversations with that are thinking the way that I'm thinking that are curious, like I am to do things that are taking risks. I just remember feeling like, okay, this is what I've been missing. Like I am an entrepreneur. That's what I do. That's amazing. And not everybody gets the opportunity to kind of have that insight. And so if they're trying to scope that, right, if somebody hasn't had that opportunity, but they're trying to determine, am I an entrepreneur? Or am I not? I mean, what are the characteristics in your mind of what makes an entrepreneur? I think it's understanding risk. There's a little bit of like an incessant need to try and, and make a change or to, to see the world in some way. Like a lot of the entrepreneurs also that I know, could we swear on this podcast? They bitch a lot. Like (laughs) they, they're just like this line, the line is set up wrong. Like the line should go around this way. Like who set this line up? Everyone's like, why do you care about the line? Something that always used to drive me crazy my dad had this car and it was one of those cars that had like the early days had like the, the interface on the front of it and you could tap it. The name of like the band or the song name, even though it had way more space on the screen was always truncated into like dot, dot, dot. I was like, use the rest of the screen. Like it just drive me crazy. I was like, who designed that? I don't know. I think there's something there where if, if that is the way that you are, you might have some ideas or you have kind of this, this need for 
constant improvement and iteration on things and wanting to push stuff. And I think that that's a trait that bodes well for success at startup is like fast failure, fast start, being okay with failure. If these are some of the things that you realize that you're good at, then, you know, maybe this world is, is for you. It can be for anyone. Like all these traits are all learned. Even with a software startup, there's designers, there's product managers, there's developers, there's sales roles, there's growth roles. And so I would say, even if you're like, I don't know what the idea is, or maybe I don't want to start something day one myself, or like, what would I start? And that's not me. I mean, there are so many startups with three, four, five people. If you could be number five or six, even if it's at a startup that you don't know if it's going to grow or anything else, like you're going to get a great experience and you're going to get closer to that nucleus of like innovation that happens. You'll just know inherently in your heart, do I like this or not? And if you're up every night, just like worried, is like this company running out of money or what's going on? It's like maybe Google is for you. And that is totally fine. There's this other class of person that's, you know, they need to be working on something that's theirs or they need to be improving or changing the world in some way. Even so, it doesn't necessarily mean that that entrepreneur is going to make as big of an impact, even as someone maybe that is at Google or is at some other company that can make an impact. They're just different things. I think startup and entrepreneurship has been glamorized in a way almost too much. It's a grind, man. It is a hardcore grind. And like you have to be willing to take the nose and being in an early stage startup is like the best and worst day of your life over and over and over again. And like, if you're not willing to kind of go through that, there's like maybe some like sadistic piece to it of like, that's just, you know, I don't know. I've always wanted to go and do a survey on every like CEO and founder and like some sort of like childhood survey when ask like, were your parents split? What went on? Like, I think a lot of people did come out of environments that might have not been the environment, but maybe you think that they came out of. I've had the opportunity to have interviews with a lot of entrepreneurs working in Web3. And I always like to ask this question about fear because I think a lot of people who may fancy themselves as an entrepreneur or involved in an entrepreneurial venture are crippled by fear, either the fear of failure, the fear of what happens next, the fear of not knowing what to do. And so my question is, I mean, how do you frame fear? Are you, are you afraid of failure? I think I was. You grapple with it. Right. And then you kind of understand what actually is failure. I also tell this to a lot of the, the younger folks or even people that would want to join Lunar Crush as an employee or someone that's a young entrepreneur trying to start their own thing is that there is no true failure with trying to start something on your own. If you go and try a startup or you're an early employee at a startup, you work there for a year or two, you are going to move leaps and bounds ahead of the rest of the people that are kind of in your class, say graduated the same year as you in the same field as you because of what you learn about how businesses organize. And it's going to blow your mind that when you get back into the workforce, you're like, oh my gosh, like I just do this one small thing. I was doing all of these other things. And I think that's why you do see people always kind of drop back into startup life because they're like, man, I need to just to do more. This is boring. The level of risk is actually much lower than you think it is when you're thinking about starting something. And I think that's the fear, you know, the fear from like, where the next paycheck's going to come from, but you're, you're going to figure it out, especially if you're younger. You know, I had a, my great uncle passed away recently and he was 101. And, you know, he had a startup at like age 90 that he did. And I think he like might have sold it or something at like 95. And then I got entrepreneurs and people are telling me that they're like 24 years old and now they're 26 and they're all freaking out about everything. And I'm like, great uncle is 90 and he ran his company five years longer than you at 95. You're only two years into it and you're like 26. You have 70 years left to figure some stuff out. Like it is not over. And so I think people sometimes have a hard time seeing five feet in front of their face, but you got to remove yourself from that fear, right? There's also these outside forces that really impact people around family and their family did this, or my dad did that, or my mom did that, or they said, go get a job at, at this consulting company versus starting my own thing. And, you know, so-and-so said it's stupid. Or when I go take this out to the world, what are people going to say? Who cares what people are going to say? Right? It just truly doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's you versus you. And can you build something? And, you know, do you think every other entrepreneur that had a ton of success, they did something, they stepped out on day one, and suddenly they were like a hero and everything was great, you know, and it was an overnight success. It just wasn't. But I think I've probably said this kind of thing on a podcast a lot, but what you realize is that some people, they just don't have everything coming to them, right? They don't have all the data. They don't have content maybe like this to, to hear from other people. And so I think that's why it actually is a hard thing for people to kind of get over. But 
you can't have fear out there. I mean, especially it's like if you're running like a software company in Web3 and crypto, it's like you're really passionate, but it's if you fail, no one's dying. It's just you back in the workforce, potentially, or starting your own thing. A lot of investors love backing second time entrepreneurs that failed. You went through it, you're trying again. They're like, okay, this kid's not going to give up. Like, let's give him a chance. And so fear is there. It's good for certain reasons. It's good to have some positive anxiety around you want to keep the lifestyle that you have and do the things that you're doing. But I would say rein it in and focus on what you're doing. Keep your expenses down. You don't need to be keeping up with the Joneses if you're trying to operate a business on a, on a shoestring budget because those little things in your life all kind of are synergistic with the outcome that happens. So it's like if you're staying fit, if you're eating well, if you're sleeping well, if you have gratitude and positive relationships in your life, if you take time to yourself and you foster relationships with friends and family that matter and do take time for that. And then you wake up in the morning, you're going to be firing on all cylinders versus treating your body like shit, eating, drinking bad, doing all of these things. That's when you don't have a full gas tank and the anxiety can creep in and all these other things can creep in. So manage yourself, manage your body and know that the outcome, no matter what it is, you're going to be better for it. So after Lifeline response, there was one more stop before you launched Lunar Crush. And so if we just kind of go back to your story here, what happened to Lifeline Response and, and what did you do afterwards? Yeah, I mean, Lifeline's still rolling. Pete over there, I think he's doing well. They're doing well. They're out there. You know, for me, it was one of those moments where it was like I needed to go do do something else and ended up serendipitously into uh, another ad agency out here in Orange County. It was actually like my co-founder now, John, who I met and he was the one that brought me in there. And, you know, it was a good example of what I'm saying of getting into an organization that did advertising that, you know, I kind of was like, I never thought I was going to even be in advertising again, after being a part of a startup. I also had a stint of like doing some sales. I was in like building construction materials at Owens Corning, which was like an amazing experience too. But anyone that's been at a startup for a couple of years, I just needed like a breather, (laughs) you know, and so found something and didn't really know what I would be doing. But this is a good example of I was at a software startup building, learned a lot about user experience and product and analytics. And these were other talents that I didn't really have beforehand. And then get into an organization and realize really quickly, like, wow, I've learned 10 times more than a lot of these people in the last couple of years. And it's probably taken them a long time to learn. That was a great example of that, of like, wow, I'm pretty good at all this stuff. And I could be helpful here. And so Spent a couple of years there working on some really awesome things. We built a a mobile app that brings the test drive to your house for Hyundai. I really treasured my time there. Great people. Got to travel a little bit. Got to see some cool stuff. We worked on everything from the website to mobile apps to strategy for like a Super Bowl ad that I got to work on. And so just got to see a lot of the different sides of the creative process that when I started my career, kind of was like, wow, I'm actually doing it. I went from the mailroom to touching a piece of like a really big piece of creative that's out there in the world now and that's got my name on it and, you know, providing some direction for those things. And so that was a really fulfilling thing for me to say, like, I've moved all the way over here, right? Because I've always kind of felt and saw myself as a very creative person, but we just went down this finance route when I was younger. And I was like, oh, finance. So it's like, I think it's great that like, hey, I can put together like some of the most badass spreadsheets and income statements like you're ever going to see. But then I also have a little bit of an eye for, hey, I like the patina of the way that this thing feels. When you look back then at this point in your career and you see the path you took to Lunar Crush and what you're working on now, does it feel like it all adds up to it? I mean, this was somewhat of a destined way. I mean, it seems like all the skills sort of fed on top of each other to get you where you are. Or do you think in some ways, you're always destined to kind of be doing what you're doing now and any path probably would have led you here. So I started to get into my thirties. I kind of realized I'm like a a CEO and and people can't take me seriously because I'm too young, but I always kind of felt like inside of a CEO's body, I guess, if you will, once I've kind of figured out what the job was of like a CEO, even as, as a startup company, the short answer is yes. Being able to see all of these different parts of businesses and then having this innate feeling that I was an an entrepreneur and that I wanted to take that risk and go do something. I would say, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that I did do the things that I did and have the experiences that I had because I think it 
set me up for success in what I would call like my second venture, but first venture that was me as a CEO and, and co-founding. It set me up to say like, I feel like I could be really good at this. And, you know, I've got the tool set, you know, and then what you learn at a startup and there's three of us that are co-founders is that we do a lot of work and we do a lot of different things. And, you know, as a CEO, you kind of just fill in the gap for the thing that that's not working or the thing that needs to be done at that moment. And those things could be very wide ranging. You're doing founder led sales. You might be doing customer support. You might need to dive in on design on something because it's not going in the direction maybe that you think is, is the direction it should go. You need to do fundraising and what's included in fundraising, right? You've got to have like a, an awesome deck, right? That makes sense. That makes people feel some, some sort of emotion with what they're seeing and the vision for that. You know, you need to be up to snuff on the, on the numbers and the financials and the revenue estimates and income statement. And you're going to have other financial people poking holes in that. So you got to make sure that you are the one hitting the keystroke to say, you know, here's my assumptions that I'm making. And so putting those things together and having like a finished product on that and really knowing that I could do that soup to nuts from start to finish myself. I think I realized I've got a lot of these little talents that took me 10 years of working in the workforce. Plus I would say starting, you know, at age 12, like making skins for like Winamp or whatever I was doing and working with Flash to make like the cool backgrounds for my whatever clan that I was working on and things like that. Like all of those little things add up and you don't realize the plethora of experience that you have until you're sitting there doing it. And then now being in kind of the saddle the last five years from Lunar Crush, the amount that I've learned and grown even since day one here, you know, no one starts out as an expert in crypto or Web3. I mean, when I started, I was just like, John came up to me one day at, at an ocean. He's like, hey, dude, you got any Bitcoin? This is like January 2015. That's when we started looking at it. And I was like, no, but like, this looks like the intersection of finance and technology. And I think that that's what I've been waiting for since I was 10 years old. You're still a beginner. You know, we didn't actually start Lunar Crush until like 2018. The beta really didn't go live to like end of 2018, early 2019. It takes time to get there and, and to, to make it all happen. But once you do it and you, you learn, now I could probably say like I'm an expert, even though I don't feel like it, but I would say, hey, I've been operating a business in the industry, you know, for over five years now. That's probably a lot more than a lot of people have done, but like, I'm still curious. I still want to grow and figure it out. And so that's where a lot of people also, they book, like, I don't know anything about it. It's like, well, if you're obsessed with it, you just got to dive in. You just got to get in there. Right. And like, I think it wasn't, until we went full time on Lunar Crush, we were talking to investors and kind of like looking around at things. But once you have that conviction and you dive in, that's when people take you seriously. And I would say if you're if you've got a little staging environment, a little beta, you know, and you're like, why am I getting like the attraction of what's going on? It's because you're probably talking to an investor or something else. And they're like, who's on it? And they're like, well, a couple of us are on it part time. But like, this thing's amazing. They're like, it is amazing. But like, you don't have conviction to leave your job. Must not be that good. Let's go back to the origins then of Lunar Crush. And you hinted towards it there a little bit with a conversation with John while you're working at in Ocean. But what was the original vision there? And, and take us back in time. Like what, what was kind of going on in your minds? What was the vision of what you wanted to accomplish? Yeah, I mean, just finding Bitcoin was amazing. You know, reading the white paper, understanding the solving of the double spend problem. Once that light bulb went off, it was an aha moment. And I think it's like for everyone in crypto and in blockchain, when they figure out what that actually means, that's pretty incredible because everything that we do stems from that moment. And I think I had that aha moment and, you know, it just kind of sat there. We didn't really take action on anything for like literally a couple of years after that. We're just working on all sorts of other stuff and we're friends. And I think the thing that personally I've kind of realized like, oh, this is someone that I could start a business with. He compliments a lot of the things that I don't do or I, I wouldn't want, want to do, right? And like, or he's better at than me. I remember John would always rearrange his office. He would always like be moving stuff. It was like every like six weeks or four weeks or something. It was like, oh, he was in like a fresh spot in the office. And it was probably because he just wanted like a new perspective or whatever else. And I, you know, I can imagine maybe he does this at home in a really weird way. I was like, I think we should start a business together because the way he thinks about design and the way like, he thinks about UI and iteration, like I said, is so important. For a startup, he's constantly iterating, constantly trying to improve product and thinking about product and going through that process. And so at some point, I just, you know, maybe it was in the back of my head at the time. And I came to this later, probably just realized like, hey, we should probably start something together. He's as obsessed about this technology as I am. He had his own kind of little entrepreneurial efforts before. 
I had some, maybe some more like formalized, like VC quote unquote raised money before. And one day we were like, Hey, let's just maybe start building this. And he had another friend that ended up being our co-founder, Dan, and Dan ended up becoming our CTO. And we went to Dan and we just said, we think that in cryptocurrency, and this is when Ethereum came out and the tokenization of everything. And there's all these tokens and we're out on Twitter looking for different opportunities. And like the only thing that was available was like coin market cap and coin gecko at the time. We're like, man, how do you know the difference between coin number 10 and coin number 80 when there are no earnings reports? There's no real traditional way to delineate value. We don't even know where the team is or if they have a team. If it's a public blockchain, there is no team. And so what what wins? And so we're like, man, this is really going to all be narrative driven. And it's all about the community. And we kind of coined this phrase early on in the industry. Without a community, there is no crypto. We search Twitter. It's like we would go back and look. It's like we were kind of the first people out there talking about community matters. And like now that's everything, right? And we kind of coined that. It's like a little bit of like our claim to fame, I would say, of just early on, like even like CZ back in the day, it was like replying in, in our stuff. I think that they ended up buying CoinMarketCap and they maybe felt like they're a competitor. So he stopped commenting on our stuff. But anyway, then we went to Dan and we were like, hey man, do you think you could get some of this data and like we could do some cool stuff with it? And so he's an amazing engineer and just started diving in on it. I just kept kind of pushing the ball forward. Like, Hey, let's try this thing. Should we do this thing? And then it was like July of 2019. You know, we had something that just worked. It was just a website that was out there, whatever we were into crypto. And then we went to a couple of different conferences in the space. I serendipitously met the managing director of the Techstars Los Angeles program. And I'd already gone through a Techstars program. And I also said to myself, I'm like, I'm never doing that again. That was just like way too intense, like three months. And now I'm married and but it was in LA. And one of the, who's now like one of our early investors, Alon was at to some other conference. Because another thing is an entrepreneur, you just got to go and meet people, even if you're not going to actually have an opportunity. It's like, I just would drive all over the place and just like an attempt to like maybe bump into people that I knew were going to be there. Like you're in people's DMs, like they're not answering, but like I'll kind of cruise up there and just poke them on the elbow. And I met Alon and we went to one of the conferences and he kind of knew me a little bit. And so it was really random, but he was, in some session and I saw him and these right at the same time bumped into the managing director of the Techstars LA program. Her name was Anna Barber and she was there and I was talking to her and I was like, Oh, I'm like, you know, CEO of this company, Lunar Crush. She's like, I've heard of Lunar Crush. I was like, no, you haven't heard of Lunar Crush. Like four people know about Lunar Crush and you're the managing director of Techstars. Like, how would you know? And she's like, I was just talking to some guy about it. Alan was already pitching us. That was great. And she's like, you should join Techstars. I was like, and I've already done it. I'm not doing it again. I can't. Like, this is just, I, I just can't. Like, we're going to find another way. So I said no. And then I am in a hotel room in Australia on a business trip. And she calls me or sends me a note and basically says that they had a company drop out of Techstars and they needed another company to come in. And I was pre vetted. I had already been through a Techstars program. I had a product that was working in the market. I think we might have had a, like a customer already. She's like, you got to make it happen. I was like, you know what? This is it. We're going for it. It's time. And so I called John and I was like, we got to do it, man. We got 48 hours. You know, I told her we're not doing any entrance, anything. And if you're listening, sorry, but like, I said, we're not doing any entrance, anything we're in, but she's like, fine, but you got to let me know right away. And so I called him and I was like, we're doing it, man. Let's do it. And at the time we actually didn't work together anymore. He had already left and, and gone to another company and uh, he came back. He said, yeah, let's do it. And so I think part of it is taking that leap, you know, and he saw probably the conviction I had. I was like, let's go, let's go. So yeah, that's how we, we got into Techstars. And then that was, you know, you go full time at something and that's like a, a, a pretty big deal. And then, you know, we're kind of off to the races from there. Talk to us about the name. Where did you guys get the name Lunar Crush and what was the ideology behind that? You know, John's wife came, <laughs> came up with it. It was like everyone in crypto was like, you're crushing it. And like, is this big gamer kind of feel around everything and everything's going to the moon, you know, up in price. And so I think lunarcrush.com was available. We ended up with Lunar Crush ever since. It's just kind of stuck. Sometimes people are, you know, they want you to change stuff and like you stick with the name. The name is the name. How has that original vision and you described it so well and it makes total sense how has the vision for lunar crush evolved over time and some of the things that you're working on we started with this idea around social listening for crypto and really what we were doing is creating transparency on the internet and in this world of instant access to all this content across different social media platforms and 
even back then when we were doing it. I mean, there wasn't as much like citizen journalism and the mainstream media was not, I think, hated on as much as it is now. We did see this idea behind the real-time ingestion of data. And really, it's just trying to distill down a million voices into insights. And how do you do that? So I think the vision has always kind of just been creating transparency. And that's an overall good thing for society. And the data that we have can be used for like anything. But we were just personally obsessed with Web3 and, and crypto. And we thought that the use case for us was creating transparency for investors in this new economy that's going to be gigantic. And like I said, Bitcoin, is like a couple hundred bucks, thousand bucks, and it's a small thing. It's a huge risk to focus on that one thing. But that was kind of what we thought and what we saw for the world was this is going to be a massive thing. And a lot of like institutions on Wall Street, and maybe this kind of stems a little bit back to like why I love it so much is that not being able to go work at Lehman Brothers in 2008 because of what happened. And all these institutions, they have access to a lot of this data. And the average everyday person doesn't really have access to that data. And so we serve both markets, but it, it does feel good to make a lot of this really impossible data that just Wall Street had access to before available for the everyday investor. You know, we got out and we're doing this long before like Wall Street bets, the AMC thing. I know we're back around to that, to like literally this week, which is hilarious, but we were doing a lot of this stuff before all that even is a fulfilling kind of prophecy for like myself to be working in kind of helping out with that. And so transparency on the internet, as we kind of have moved through that, the vision going forward is still that, uh, you know, we've expanded the ability on Lunar Crush to look at other categories. So it's not just cryptocurrencies, NFTs and stocks. You know, you can go see the top 25 luxury brands, or you can go see the top automotive brands and, you know, who's talking about them and which influencers are the most influential over those brands and how are they ranked over time. And so it's really broadening out the data set and letting anyone that's really looking for social arbitrage for anything, social arbitrage for marketing, for your you know, influencer count or growing, or whether you're looking at it for you know, potentially investing in something, it's really just giving you the tools. And once you have access to this data, it's like you can't really go without it. Prior to Lunar Rush, as you've already explained, I mean, you would build up some strong skills and know-how when it comes to advertising and marketing, and you had expertise there. Then you go to work on Lunar Crush, and now here you are working in Web3. How has this experience reshaped or maybe evolved the way you think about advertising and marketing? Yeah, that is a great question because it has changed a lot, right? And I think I've seen the evolution in just my career from looking at different jobs that we would launch for different brands back then. And it's, you know, there's billboards, there's out of home stuff. Like there's a lot of that that's going on to then like the most hardcore mobile advertising and banner ads and digital is this huge thing that everyone's focused on. And then it's now bam, social media, and it's got to be content, 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 and everyone's got to make all, all this content. And like, that's what it's all about. And it's all about content. And now going through like even COVID when it went probably even heavier, that was probably like the peak of like the content. Everyone's got a podcast. Everyone's live streaming. People didn't make it like you did through the, through the storm. They gave up. And now it's like, I think we're to like this experiential world a little bit. And like experiences are really are what are impactful for people because people are inside their homes. You know, I was talking about this with a friend yesterday. It's like, social media is actually like, you're just droning on when you're on this. And it's, it's almost like the ads on there it's like, it's just like another thing. And you don't know what's an ad and what's not an ad because, you know, some influencer has been hired to wear a watch, especially Gen Z is a little bit more numb to that. You know, there's no bias towards any sort of brand out there. They're just agnostic trying to figure out what matters. And so I think these brands are trying to create experiences. And you know, that's why you see a lot of conferences and speakers and parties, like especially in our industry, it's all conference driven. And that's where we all go do BD because we don't get to see each other. And so everyone's really focused on like the experience there and like what's the feeling that they can give you that you can associate back with that brand and almost say like that brand's cool. It's like it's Nike. It's like I just want to be a part of that brand because Michael's a part of it. I want to be cool like that. And so I think we've seen an evolution there. And crypto, I would say the change from Web 2 to Web 3 was this organic all online. You know, they don't have like Discord channels. They probably tried it once it really got big for crypto, but it's like, there's probably not like a really epic blown out discord environment for 
like Kohler. Kohler's kick ass, by the way. They're amazing. Like, I'm not talking shit on Kohler. It's just an old company that does like has the best customer support like ever. Kohler, you guys rock. There's just a different thing there. But that's the type of customer, crypto kind of maniac, crypto hardcore. It's like they live on Twitter, they live on Discord, they're they're on Telegram. Like all the BD in our industry, as you probably know, is all done on like Telegram and a little bit of WhatsApp. No one emails. It's business to business for certain specific things, but then people are like, hey, can we take this down to Telegram? Can we take this down to Telegram? Can we take this down to Telegram? And then it's just like, because you never really know when you're going to need to contact someone. And it's like, I can't have SMS with the guy from Google. Like I need to like use something else. So I think it's changed a lot. And I think it's a great question because it's still evolving. And the way that social media is about to change, you know, with TikTok, we'll see what happens there. X, the algorithms changed a lot. And people on there finding different ways to grow. Live stream is a huge thing. What happened at Clubhouse? Twitter Spaces then dominated. You know, I saw something. I think it was like Naval was backing it, where it was this like audio only, but also it's like as you're scrolling, you're hearing audio. I thought that was pretty cool, but haven't figured it out. Then you've got like Warpcast or Farcaster, which is like decentralized social that seems to like be doing well. I would say they're like doing the best. So there's just a lot out there. And as a brand, you're like, where do you focus? Especially as a small team. And so you kind of have to just pick a couple or pick one and be really good at it and like make sure that you're getting product market fit and you're growing organically before you start spending money. How do you reconcile in your mind when it comes to crypto? This question of value, what value is created by a project or a team, and then this very crypto driven Twitter, CT, sentiment driven kind of value that seems to be all about token and token prices. I mean, how do you think through and reconcile that? You use the word reconcile because you have to kind of reconcile how insane it is and how a lot of times it's not going to make sense in your mind and how the market can stay crazy a lot longer than you can stay solvent. That's the world that we're in. It's very narrative driven. I mean, we're seeing it with what we saw with AMC, right? Shorts getting liquidated hedge funds going under because retail investors want to support someone and like support a cause because so-and-so is not selling, right? That just makes absolutely no sense. And it's, it's short lived, but it did make an impact. But in crypto, it's, it's always been hard. And that's why we said without a community, there is no crypto. And what is a meme coin? I mean, what is a meme stock? What is it? But you know, what I've kind of realized over the years is that what is a country club? Sure, I can go play golf there, but some people are, you can have a social membership there too. And all you do is you go and you meet up and you have dinner, right? And you pay money to be, have access to that. And those things have existed for a hundred years. And those are massive things. There's social clubs all over our country and everywhere in the world. And so NFTs started down that path. And I think this kind of last meme coin craze was, hey, like I can't afford a board ape, right? For a hundred thousand dollars, but I can buy... $20 $20 worth of Dogecoin or $10 worth, you know, worth a slurf or whatever it was, you know, on Solana. And I can be a part of something and whether or not it's short lived or long lived, you know, like I look at something like a Floki, they've like built some schools last cycle. They've got a Dex, they've got more utility than like some layer ones, to be honest with you. Like they truly do. They got more holders and more users than some layer ones. And they're just a meme coin that's turned into something. And I think that that kind of inverted business model is confusing for people. You know, you used to, start a product in a garage, you know, maybe go get some investors or maybe some early customers. And then like you grow a brand and these people are inverting that and they're like growing a brand and then working into the product. And that's really confusing. And I think like angers some people because they feel like all these people are raising money and getting all this stuff and they haven't done anything. It's like, well, man, you know how hard it is to get attention in this world. It might be harder to get attention than it might be to even like build something of value, honestly. And so the attention is the value. And so I think that that, is confusing for people. It doesn't make sense. But at some point, you do need to deliver something, right? But that something can be community. It can be meetups. It can be something that's like, that's, that's fine. But I think you have to turn it into something to have that staying power. You know, we look in the top 10 cryptos over the last 10 years. I mean, 10 years ago, there's only one coin that's still in the top 10 that was there 10 years ago. And that's Bitcoin, right? Nothing has staying power. That's a lesson. I, I, you know, the utility side of it, I think it, Close people's minds sometimes when there's a token that has like all this awesome utility and it's not doing anything. We still are in this kind of weird speculative cycle moment for crypto. 
people even give Bitcoin shit about like Bitcoin really doesn't like do anything. It's like, well, it's worth a trillion dollars. People love it. People would rather die than or like cut their hand off and get rid of it. Like, I think there's some conviction there. You can't deny the utility around, you know, just hodling. Every cycle, it seems like, has themes that sort of drive sentiment. Going back, obviously, there was the ICO craze. There was DeFi summer. What do you sort of envision as the topics that will drive sentiment in maybe this cycle or in the cycles to come? Yeah, we've gone through some interesting ones with NFTs, DeFi, ICO craze. We went through that. I mean, Bitcoin's always just been Bitcoin and I feel like leads everything off. This time around, it started with Bitcoin again, you know, the ETFs, the institutional adoption that we're seeing, the inflows that we're seeing. And it went very quickly to meme coins, which I think was confusing for people. It's like institutional adoption and we're formalized and everyone's an adult now. And then people are like, you know, buy like shit coin number 28. Like it was like, geez, it's like it's just confusing people. But people were so burnt by what happened with FTX, like the, your average, like more like Robin Hood, white collar investor that they just didn't come back yet. And so it was just a bunch of us DGENs, gamers in the corner, just trading our little meme coins back and forth. It was a lot of that money because money wasn't making it from the Bitcoin ETF suddenly like into pancake swap. It was just not going that, that direction. It's going like back into Netflix or whatever it is from your, you know, when you buy your iShares like Bitcoin ETF. And so this term narrative is new for this cycle. You've been around a while. We didn't actually use the term narrative. We started talking about everything as a project back in like 2018, 2019, and then people started calling it projects too. And I, I thought that was really interesting because that was a new phrase because people are like, well, if we call it a project, we're calling it a project because like it's not anything yet and it might not be anything. So it's just a project and they just so happen to have a $10 billion war chest of Bitcoin like EOS because like they've got 130,000 Bitcoin because they did that. And now it's like EOS has more money than like most endowment funds in America and whether or not they have utility, it doesn't matter because like you could just manage that money in perpetuity. So I think narrative is interesting because we're searching for a narrative. And it's not there. People say, oh, it's AI. It's like, it's, they're only saying AI because OpenAI came out and that's like a thing. And that's exciting. So it's literally just like people thinking that crypto, there, there's really very rare intersections of crypto and AI that are making sense. It's like maybe like BitTensor is like the only one. And there's really not a lot out there. Like a lot of the projects, like they've all repurposed and rebranded themselves in some ways. I'm like, I interviewed that guy four years ago and now suddenly they're like an AI token. Like there's no change. So I think that's kind of like scary in a way, you know, real world assets. That's like another narrative people are talking about. That's just security tokens. We've had that forever. You know, like we've talked about that. I think it's like BTP down in like Brazil has been trying to securitize stuff. It's just, it's not there. It's like, I'm not seeing the application. Like I want an app that like can use my Bitcoin as collateral to like buy a home, you know, as home prices hopefully come down here and get like more millennials and more Gen Z into homes utilize the utility of maybe the assets that they have lending borrowing stuff like that would be interesting but honestly we're searching you know the having came like building on bitcoin i would say is the closest thing that we have to like excitement but there's a lot of rebuilding that needs to happen of this standard DeFi applications on bitcoin specifically before you could really have the breakout and the app layer that you want i would say but the fact that you can inscribe things in the bitcoin blockchain The fact that you can launch a token with ruins now on the Bitcoin blockchain in a better way. I know there was BRC20 as well. It's very interesting. And you're going to see new people coming in because all roads feel like they do lead to Bitcoin in a way. And all of us, if we're in the industry, whether or not you're like hardcore solidity dev building on ETH for your entire life, at the end of the day, without Bitcoin, we're all dead. It's not happening. Like if Satoshi came around and said, Hey, I'm Satoshi. And it was proven Bitcoin goes to zero in my opinion. Like we have these set ways in our industry and it's like, it all leads back to Bitcoin. And so I feel like if there's anything special that's going to happen, it's going to happen out of that narrative, I guess, air quotes, since we're on audio only, it's like out of that narrative, I'd like to see more. I'd like to see more adoption from an app layer with banking, the ability for people to, to lend and to borrow and to utilize their cryptocurrencies in in better ways. You know, I think if you did that, more people would probably pay taxes, more people would, you know, start to utilize these things versus it just being kind of like in this, like this funny money in some random land. If you put on your finance background, your macroeconomics thinking, and you zoom out and look at all the cycles, 
are they evolving over time as well? I mean, this cycle seems fundamentally different from all the prior ones, but maybe that's what everybody says as we enter a cycle. But how do you think about that? I think the adoption level, 2015, finding Bitcoin and probably paying 200 bucks for my first one and selling it probably at like 170 and taking a loss there. Like if I, if BlackRock was, you know, now, you know, and Larry Fink, like if, if I saw the people at that level talking the way that they're talking now, it would blow. Like if you go back in time, it would blow everyone's mind. So I think it's in a weird way. Bitcoin is kind of like a religion. It's like a positive mind virus. I would say it's a truth machine. And I think once people, no matter who you are at what level, once they realize what it is and what it's capable of and they admit it and they embrace it, there's no turning back. Once you understand it, it's like you never would suddenly be like, I hate Bitcoin, right? Even if maybe you made a really shitty trade and you lost a bunch of money, but I hate Bitcoin. And then suddenly now it's up. It's like, well, if you just would have held, you would have made a ton of money. Why were you trading it? That's your fault. That's not Bitcoin's fault. It's not the truth machine's fault. That's changing the world with the technology that's never been done before and sensor resistant computer with millions of nodes, right? That's not that thing's fault. That's your fault. Get out of your own head. We've come so far. And I think each cycle we go through different things as much as I hated the fact that FTX happened because there's so many amazing builders and everyone had to just basically eat shit for a year and a half and say that you suck, you know, you're building. And like, I think it was important for certain reasons to rid out some of the actors that might be doing more nefarious things. It's like any sort of new technology you're going to, that's going to happen. But I think we're, we're at least like a, a stub function ahead or away from that now. And that makes me excited. And so, yeah, I'd say we've made incredible progress with the technology. Interoperability has gotten a lot better. You know, I, I think we have like some UX layer things that can change, but that being said, it could just be people aging up and being so good at technology even from a young age that we don't need, like people might just un- inherently like the world might just work. We're like, Oh, I have a key that I put into my car and I turn my car on someone in Gen Z be like, Oh, I have my mnemonic and my private key. Like that's just how the world works. I just know that that's how it works. And everyone grows up knowing that's how it works. So we all come out of the womb with a private key. Like we just know. So I think it's like that actually is the change that's going to happen. And just like everyone has a bank account and routing number and a checking account or a credit card they're going to be able to work with the technology in a way because they grew up with it. And I think that's why it's a long tail change, but it's happening. Joe, I only have a few more questions before I ask you the GRTIQ 10. And these are 10 questions I ask each guest of the podcast every week. They're super fun. Give us a chance to get to know you a little bit better and get some recommendations and some ideas from you. But the first question is, you may know this, but a lot of my listeners are very enthusiastic about the graph and the things that the ecosystem is working on. From your perspective at Lunar Crush and some of the things that you've seen over there, do you have any perspective or opinions on the community at the graph and the things that the protocol is working on? Yeah, I mean, I interviewed Tegan Klein like a long time ago. I know she was pretty instrumental in those early days. And I think it was like Edge and Node that she was working on. Can't remember exactly, but I was very impressed, you know, with her take on the market. And I think, you know, the graph, we saw that very early on at Lunar Crush. It was like all over social people talking about it. And it grew this like really awesome community. But I think it's it's become kind of like this fundamental layer, like the indexer for what is possible, you know, from a data side, you know, within blockchain, right? Like, I think it's like a very needed portion of our industry and economy that's like here to stay. You know, I think that's why, you know, when you see the market kind of move, it's like always tethered to it with like a little bit higher of a beta right (laughs) on the market. So I'd say keep building. It's tough because it's like, there's probably, it doesn't feel like there's like too many like super sexy things that have, that have come out. It's more like infrastructure that's kind of come out. So it's like, you know, maybe you don't need it. Boring is good. Everything's gone kind of like dormant over the last two years. And it's like, I don't want to see the graph rebrand and try to be a meme coin or anything else like that. Like continue to be yourself and keep building and you know, I've always wanted to collaborate in some way. Lunar Crush, we got a ton of data that's like off chain. You know, we're pulling all this social data. Like, how could people utilize that within like a subgraph? So it's like it's something that I've always kind of thought about too. So I gotta, I gotta keep, I gotta keep digging. Amazing. And the final question is: When I talked to people that I was going to have the opportunity to interview you, and over the course of this time we spent together, a lot of people said, you know, you're such a great guy, such a nice, down to earth guy, and clearly that's true. You've talked about family a little bit during this interview. And I guess the question I want to ask is how have you balanced kind of staying true to yourself, staying true to values and and family, given the fact that you work in 
this industry that's 24 seven, 365 and you're an entrepreneur and all the pressure and kind of risk and stress that comes with that? Yeah, I love, I love that question. I mean, you know, I definitely have the calendar and the calendly set up in a way to where I, you know, I have certain days where I have calls, you know, available later in the day for me, which like opens up Singapore and, you know, Asia and have to take those calls. You know, I definitely have calendar open early in the morning for, you know, the calls like in Europe and, and Dubai. And then you get into the day here and we're on the West coast and you've got town halls and you've got everything else going on. I mean, we're a decentralized team. So that does help, you know, for timing, it's like no commuting or anything anywhere, which I think is good for some people, probably not as good for the younger generation that doesn't have a chance to like learn in the office, but for someone that's like operating and has a family, it's like the best you could possibly imagine for most people. And then I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, it was like, you know, just really always have been focused on health and fitness ever since I was young and never have never lost that my entire life. I've always had something, whether it was rotating different workouts at the gym, kickboxing, whether I was playing softball or soccer and organized leagues, you know, whether it was putting together a a gym in the side of my yard that was like pretty functional and like staying on top of that, whether it's trying new diets, whether it's different technology, you know, with the Apple watch to like figure out how I'm sleeping to make sure that like my HRV is, is where it needs to be or like having the data that like, Oh, if I do have dinner a little bit late or I have a drink later at night, my HRV goes down, my heart rate goes up when I'm sleeping. I, I feel more tired that day and just making those adjustments and having enough in your gas tank. Cause like always talk about this with people, especially younger entrepreneurs. It's like, you're not Elon. Like you don't have just like people waiting on you. Like I doubt Elon's like cranking like food and stuff is kind of just done. It's like, but he's the one of the richest guys in the world. You're still going to do the dishes. You're still going to have to take your kids to soccer practice. If you're younger, you still have friends and obligations and people are like, Hey man, let's go to Hawaii and go surfing. Sometimes you have to say no to those things. And sometimes you have to prioritize work. And so there's no getting out alive. What I mean is like, there's no getting out and getting to even a decent level of success in a startup and not sacrificing like kind of a lot at certain times. You know, I think it's also really important if you are with someone is to have a partner that understands and being very clear with them. You know, some of the things that I try to do ahead of time, if I kind of know I have a time period coming up, that's just going to be crazy or crazier than what is already crazy. I try to communicate that and say, Hey, I think next week's going to kind of suck just so that you know, And sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But I think getting out ahead of those things and being transparent on it helps the other person that you're with support you more. Knowing a lot of other entrepreneurs too, most of the people I know that have been very successful, that have stayed together, the significant other was extremely supportive and understood the sacrifice that needed to be made at certain times. And that yes, like the work sometimes did have to come first. I'm not saying it has to happen all the time, but it 100% needs to happen sometimes if you are going to be successful in the way that you think you can with a startup, just plain and simple. And so I've just over the years done that. And even with the second startup, it was kind of like, you know, like I said, best worst day ever. I've tried to kind of take the edge off the top and the bottom of those things a little bit where it's like, don't get too high, don't get too low, know that some weeks you're not going to make an impact. It's going to be a bear market and things are going to slow down. And even if, you know, you got, you know, LeBron James to post about you or something, like sure you might have one day, but then it's going to die again. So I think it's like really internalizing that there are ebbs and flows to this process and you can't have the best day every day. It needs to be a little bit of both. And so, yeah, I mean, prioritize it. You can build an epic startup with a family. You can do great things. You know, you don't need to work till 2 a.m. every single night and burn the candle at both ends and like do what you need to do. But what I will say is that, you know, you've got family, you've got work, you got friends. And one of those things is going to sacrifice at some point in time. And like, you're not going to be able to show up for dinner for friends once in a while. You're going to have to say no. You know why you're doing it. And the people that care about you, they know what you're trying to achieve. And then, you know, if they don't, you got to tell them, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do this right now. Can you support me on it? You know, who's going to say no? Amazing answer. And I appreciate taking time to take us through that. So as I said, I want to now ask you the GRT IQ 10. These are 10 questions I ask each week and I do it because I want listeners to learn something new, try something different or achieve more in their own life. So Joe, are you ready for the GRT IQ 10? (laughs) Yeah. And you kind of sent me some of these and I started reading it and I was like, 
I don't want to read it. I just want to answer on the fly. So I'm excited to like just see what my brain thinks when you ask me it. The GRT IQ 10. <laughs> 10 questions for astronauts floating G- in space. G- what book or article has had the most impact on your life? I'd have to put Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Probably one of the top there. I read it when I was 18 years old. That one, I was like probably in my 20s, but it was Thoughts Are Things. This idea that the thing in your head, you know, no matter how small, there's like this electric impulse, like that happens, like a synapse that fires. Like that's a real piece of matter that like is happening. And I think there's something really weird about that that made me think like, oh, this idea could become a real thing. So that one was important. And then my mom gave me uh, the five love languages when that was the one that I got when I was 18 and just talks about kind of internalizing personality and the way that you want to be loved is different than the way that maybe someone else wants to be loved. And whether those five love languages are the real thing or not, it's like a good lesson. It helps you realize that you need to learn the way that the person you're with, if you're in love with them, wants to be loved that helps make a huge difference in happiness. And so once you kind of realize that, I think it's really important. So yeah, those two. Is there a movie or a TV show that you would recommend everybody should watch? As an entrepreneur, like I watch Silicon Valley on HBO, like once every like four years. It is just so spot on. It's and even though it was like, I think 2014 when it came out, it's so good. You just have to watch it. I die laughing every time I watch it. There's also some lessons. Like if you're an early entrepreneur, you might like actually pick up a few things. If you could only listen to one music album for the rest of your life, which one would you choose? Ooh, that one's like, I can't even answer that. There's so many. It's like, depending on the mood. Oh my gosh. There's an album by Boston. I'd probably listen to it's eight songs. Just, just rock out. What's the best advice someone's ever given to you, Joe? What's the best advice? Do it now. Just do it now. What's one thing you've learned in your life that you don't think most other people have learned or know quite yet. Like happiness. It's like, it's something earned in a way. There's a lot that, that goes into happiness. People think, you know, I need to get to this certain spot in my life or I need to get money or I need to achieve this thing or I need to see that. It's a lot more internal than that and soul seeking than that. And I think that that maybe is something that a lot of people are, they struggle with and and they feel like it's something that like I've, I finally kind of figured out. So I think it's like identifying happiness. But what's the best life hack you've discovered for yourself? Probably cold plunge. I know it's like a, such a standard like startup CEO thing, but my God, is it effective? What are some of the benefits you've had from that? Like mental acuity of if you're having a day, whether it's a good day or a bad day, it makes the bad day better, the good day even better than that. If you don't work out, you feel something and then maybe you start working out. If you do it after you work out, you feel good. If you do it before you work out, you feel good on a hot day. It's amazing. I and mean, there's just so many things. I don't know. I mean, the science behind it, I know is like hit or miss, but like, it's something that I got into a couple years back. And that is a little hack there, especially for just, if you you're seeking energy. Based on your own life experiences and observations, what's the one habit or characteristic that you think best explains how people find success in life? Curiosity is really important, but I think two things together, it's focus and then the ability like winning and losing. There's people that love to win and then there's people that hate to lose. If you want to be on a winning team, you actually got to go with the person that hates to lose, not the person that loves to win. And then the final three questions are complete the sentence type questions. The first one is the thing that most excites me about Web3 is the people. And how about this one? If you're on X, I still call it Twitter, then you should be following. Mike Alfred. I love that guy. He's hilarious. And then the final question, Joe, I'm happiest when? I'm with my family. The GRT IQ 10. And I show you how deep the podcast. Joe, I want to say, first and foremost, how grateful I am that you came on the GRTIQ podcast. Every once in a while, I get the opportunity to interview somebody, and I'm completely surprised and amazed that I get the opportunity, and it's indeed the case with you. I really appreciate you coming on, sharing so much insight and wisdom, and sharing the story of Lunar Crush and kind of how you got to where you are. I'll put a lot of links in the show notes for anybody that wants to click and learn more and, and explore that. But for listeners that want to stay in touch with you, follow your work, what's the best way for them to stay in touch? Check me out on Twitter at Joe Vez. So my name is Joe Vizzani, but it's just Joe Vez. And then at Lunar Crush. This has been a production.
production of the GRT IQ podcast. For more information, including detailed show notes, visit grtiq.com slash podcast. That's grtiq.com slash podcast. Please consider contributing to this project and helping build the community by subscribing and leaving a review. G-R-T-I-Q podcast.